welcome back to Orlando, Florida for this evening's for the 141st Supreme Convention for the Knights of Columbus coming to you live. EW Chance complete coverage from Orlando World Center Marriott. I'm Doug Keck and I'm joined again on set by Senior Vice President for Strategic Outreach and Senior Advisor for the Knights, Jonathan Reyes. It's amazing he does multiple jobs. And Michael Warsaw, ew is also a multi-man, chairman of the board and also our, our CEO for a lively evening called the State's Dinner. And I can see that you two gentlemen are dressed for the occasion. Tell us, uh, what are your experiences about the State's Dinner being them over the years? Well, it's definitely lively. Uh, I'm a veteran of a number of them, as is Jonathan. Um, and it's, I think it's, you know, it's a wonderful social opportunity to, for, for the Knights who are attending to be able to come together uh, to show their state pride and the pride of their, their countries or whatever locations they're from. Um, but it's, it's, so it's a fun event, first of all. But secondly, it's a serious event um, as well in the sense that it's uh, the venue where the Knights of Columbus present its highest award. Uh, it's presented every oh, the year. Gaudium Spez award, the Gaudium yeah. Spez award, exactly. Um, and as the Supreme, the Supreme Knight announced earlier this morning, obviously honoring Mother Mary Agnes Donovan of the Sisters of Life, who's extraordinary woman, extraordinary woman um, who was the foundress of that community and uh, just done so many wonderful, wonderful things through the years. So um, so that's a that's that's the, the most important I think part of the evening. So they usually have the what the states and representatives of different countries parade in. How do they decide who actually goes first in alphabetical order? I honestly don't know the answer to that, Doug. That is a good question. That is a good question. But the states go in alphabetical order. Right. That's okay. true. Mm -hmm. like, uh, sounds like we're in Jamaica here. So uh, Yeah, we did. Yeah, it is. That's one, exactly. a ton of music at this exactly. event. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we can see, if I, I'm looking down the hall, I can see the uh, beginning, actually, now of the, I see California and other states coming. I even see Alabama. There we go. Uh, the Alabama flag. So, so when you go to the states dinner, what do you look forward to? I, you know, personally, what I look yeah. forward to, one is the spirit of the whole thing, as Michael was saying, yeah, yeah. which is key. And you and I were talking earlier just about, you know, some sort of celebration, joy when you come together as a group is right. really important for a fraternity and for a group of people. Mm -hmm. And then the families are there, and so it's very jovial. But it's, it's the honoring. It's the honoring with the award. And the reason I like that is because, for me, it's always pointing to something that's going very, very well in right. the church. Right some way in which God is clearly intervening and is just showing his hand. You know, exactly. the Lord's always at work. We can't always see it. But for me, it lifts up something that's inspiring that says, you know, the Lord's here. And so I always leave uplifted from this. Absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and um, you know, those who've been selected to receive the award year after year are truly extraordinary people. Mother Teresa you know, was Mother the first Teresa, one. exactly. You know, so, and, and tonight's honoree, uh, Mother Agnes, is, right. you know, who... I said was the founder of the Sisters of Life, just in a, an amazing community that's grown exponentially, exponentially. Right, you know, and Mother Agnes working together with Cardinal O'Connor, their their founder, um, you know, really to bring that community into existence. And they're, they're just extraordinary women when you meet them and talk to them. Um, just, just beautiful, holy, uh, very bright typically very professional women who have come to, to really dedicate their lives um, to the cause of life. And so uh, honoring Mother Agnes as she ends her tenure as the Mother General. Right, I heard that. Um, and that's she's funny. retired now and stepped right. away after all of those years. Um, that's a beautiful thing, and right. I think um, it's a wonderful thing that it the actually, Knights have It's actually that. symbolic of something, or not sy symbolic, maybe representative of a, of a bigger phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier, Doug and I, just about how joyful she was when we were yes. speaking to her and her nonsense. Yeah. There are a lot of religious orders like that. Yes. And uh, EWTN oh. does a great job of lifting those up, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the things you've been able to do is present this to people. But to see religious life lived heroically and joyfully at Absolutely. the same time, right. th there's, there's no other testament quite mm -hmm. like it. No, it, right. It, That's it, such it. an important witness to the world in this time, you know. And, right. and uh, you know, when, when 
obviously over many, many decades, the decline of vocations to right. religious life. Um, but many of these communities that have that dynamic um, are thriving, they're growing, they are, you know, just have exploded exponentially. Right. Um, you know, and that's a great sign of the Holy Spirit at right. work in the church. It's a great sign of, you know, that dedication and the fact that, you know, right. women women want that life. They want to right. devote. As long as it, it has that charism, the founders' charism, I mean, it's something dedicated to the church and the devotional work of the church historically. Mm -hmm. And they're thriving. We see that with the Nashville Dominicans. We see that with their Mother Assumptive's order and several other orders that are out there. They're thriving. In fact, I think I had a chance to ask one of the uh, sisters, the life sisters, what was the average age? And I think it's 35. Yes. Yeah. And everything you just, there was just an article recently about how many of the orders were collapsing. And, you know, the average age was like 85 or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. It's very sad because so many of us were educated by those systems. Right, right, right. right. You know, the average age of the Knights is even dropping a bit. But what I was going to ask you about is, as you're expanding, what are you mm -hmm. finding overseas? What are you finding in terms of religious life thriving? And sure, yeah. Is no. it the same dynamic? I, I, think in, I think in certain places around the world, I think, um, you know, we collaborate with many, many groups throughout the church globally. Um, certainly we do a lot in Africa where you see, you know, religious life being very, very strong and very dynamic and where the church is very young. Uh, you see that in pockets uh, in, in Asia and Asia Pacific as well. You know, you think of the Philippines. Uh, I mean, certainly there's, a, there's an exciting dynamic there, that, you know, a young vibrancy to the church. Um, Europe, it's, it's really, you know, kind of depends on where you are and you, you see different things. I think where, where I'm most encouraged is really in uh, the visits that I've made and, and the work that we've done with uh, many of the, the, the groups in Eastern Europe in particular where, uh, you know, again, young church, young people, uh, they're, you know, in Poland, Hungary, uh, you know, throughout the, the Eastern European countries, you, 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 know, you walk into churches, these are young people, right. these are young people who are on fire for the faith right. um, and who are engaged in the life of the church, who are engaged, uh, certainly we see, whether it's through our affiliates uh, in, right. in the Absolutely. various languages, yeah. you know, these are, these are wonderful young people who are, you know, in their 20s often, you know, who are working in, in our affiliate offices and, mm -hmm. and who love the Lord, who love the right. faith, they love the church, and they they want to give their lives to that. And, and that's really right. exciting. Right, and it's always interesting, again, so many of these areas, they were under Soviet control, atheist control, persecuted churches, whether they themselves were persecuted or they saw it in their parents or their grandparents, and that's, and to some degree, that persecution like grits the faith of those mm -hmm. people. Sometimes when things are too easy for us in the West, mm -hmm. whether it be in Europe, the United States, and we take things for granted, it's easy to let them slip away. Absolutely. I think, you know, you know there's that old phrase that people throw around about there's no atheists in foxholes, you know. Right. Um, and there, there's a certain truth to that in the sense that, um, you know, the true, real, serious persecution, you know, really really deepens the faith and really um i mean it's a it's a great witness to all of us you know that, that to sort of uh step back for a moment and realize that you know our problems our issues right. or the persecutions that we are legitimately seeing here in the united states let's say from you know the the secular society or uh, government etc um they're bad and and we need to be vigilant and we need to push back on that but it doesn't it, it, it doesn't go to the level that, that right. some of our brothers and sisters you know around the world particularly in those former soviet countries have have really experienced or elsewhere around the world where our brothers and sisters are going through that right, right now. now right yeah, right, right now, now. Well, in africa there's with so many Middle Middle Africa, Africa, places exactly. like that where things exactly. are going on with the with islam well yeah. this, this this lets me ask both of you an interesting question then so if that's not the dynamic in the states which it isn't thank god i mean i don't think we'd want persecution even though right. it has that result what is the strategy then programming for uwtn and, and outreach and how do we communicate to this age that same call to a certain kind of heroism and 
in the well, gospel. I, I, what do you think? I think it's continuing to do what we've done, but to do it in different ways and, and utilizing the new technologies, utilizing some of the younger people who are coming up who have that dynamism for the faith mm -hmm. and at the same time are part of that culture that understands how to reach younger people, you know, in their devices, in that digital space, all of that, to be able to do that so that we can continue to reach and feed those people who we fed all these years, but also continue to reach out further and, and reach the young to help them overcome mm -hmm. some of the secularism that's out there. Yeah, and I think ultimately, you know, the, the, the mission that Mother Angelica outlined for EWTN when she founded it over 40 years ago was the advancement of truth. You know, that's the kernel of our mission statement. Well, as we know, the truth attracts. You know, it, it, it draws people right. in. It convicts people. And so I think for us, it's really about right. remaining true to that mission of preaching the truth in season and out and, right. and making sure that we are always true. Whatever content we produce, whatever um, methods or platforms we use, right. uh, that we stay true to that core of our mission. Okay, you know, great. It was, it was interesting, just the last comment was yep. the most, I would say, energized moment in the Supreme Night speech today was precisely when he stood up for truth. Right, and absolutely. Said, we will stand for and this and truth. And that's Veritatis Avandir, what that Mother Angelica was absolutely. all about. And with that said, we're going we're gonna to take our, our leave of you two so you can enjoy your evening. And of course, and we're going to go take a look inside the event of the state's dinner.
join me in thanking the members of the 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Liberty, North Carolina. Our invocation this evening will be delivered by His Eminence Timothy Cardinal Dolan. As Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Dolan. As Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Dolan has one of the toughest jobs in the church, and yet he makes it look easy. He's a tireless pastor and a courageous leader, a shepherd of America's largest city, even as he stands on the world stage. It is doubly fitting that His Eminence is with us tonight as we celebrate one of the Archdiocese of New York's greatest gifts to the church, the Sisters of Life and their founding Superior General. Please join me in welcoming the Cardinal Archbishop of what St. John Paul II once called the capital of the world, Your Eminence. <laughs> Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. To be here with so many members of your family, the Church, dear Lord, is cause for prayer indeed. Brother knights and families are here, bishops, priests, deacons, seminarians, women and men religious, Mother Mary Agnes Donovan of the Sisters of Life, this year's recipients of the prestigious Gaudium et Spes Award, knights from around the world, united in faith, fraternity, and charity. We praise you indeed for this microcosm of the Church Universal we now savor in this state's dinner. But we especially thank you for the presence of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, who is seated at each of our tables as well. It is he who inspired Blessed Father Michael McGivney and those founders at St. Mary's Parish in New Haven 141 years ago. It is he who sustains the Knights in its priority of remaining first in faith and charity as determined in our mission of evangelization and faith formation as we are in our acclaim apostolates of charity and fraternalism. No wonder we whisper, Viva Jesus, grateful. He lives for sure in our aspirations, our gathering this evening deep in our souls. And on this feast of St. Alphonsus Liguori, we seek the company and intercession as well of our mother of perpetual help of St. Joseph and Blessed Father Michael McGivney, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cardinal Dolan. Your Eminences, Your Beatitude, Your Excellencies, my brother, knights, and ladies, welcome to the state's dinner. I'm grateful to be with all of you for an evening of friendship and fraternity. This is a time to celebrate what we've achieved together with God's help. And we're equally here to steel ourselves for the serious work that lies ahead. This morning I said that we must always strive to be first in faith and charity. Blessed Michael McGivney and the First Knights gave us this mission, and for 140 years we have risen to the challenge. Last year was proof. $185 million in charitable giving, 49 million hours of volunteer service. We reached 20 years of giving wheelchairs to the needy around the world and we've now given nearly one million coats to kids. In Ukraine, we ran mercy centers for refugees at the border, and our KFC charity convoys are running much-needed supplies into the middle of a war-torn country. And in the year since Roe v. Wade was overturned, we've stepped up to support vulnerable moms and their children through ASAP. Everything we do springs
Everything we do springs from our commitment to our Catholic faith. This morning I spoke about several of our new initiatives, the core meeting, our Bible study, our upcoming video series on family and fatherhood. The Knights of Columbus is committed to faith formation so we can, be, so we can better evangelize our families and communities. One of the most powerful ways we point others to Christ is through our works of charity. The needs in our society are growing more numerous, not less. Yet our determination to meet them is growing even faster. We will protect more families through life insurance. We will support more mothers and their unborn babies. And whether it's children with disabilities or immigrant communities, we will serve the most vulnerable, just as we always have. And as I look ahead, to the year ahead, I am confident we will prove once again that where there's a need, there's a night. In all we do, we follow the footsteps of Father McGivney, reaching out to our brothers and sisters. Pope Francis has said, every Christian is a missionary. That must include all two million Knights of Columbus. Our work and our witness matter more than before. And so, no, and so tonight, I ask you to join me in recommitting ourselves to our timeless mission. Let us trust in God as he guides us forward, first in faith and charity. Please be seated. We have already had the great pleasure of hearing our host ordinary preach this morning. It's clear that the Diocese of Orlando has a fine shepherd. Bishop John Noonan was installed as the first, as the fifth Bishop of Orlando in 2010. Previously, he served an, as an auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Miami. And I know it will please everyone, or at least Cardinal Dolan and me, to know that he was born in Ireland. He came to the United States as a young man and soon after pursued a vocation to the priesthood. Bishop Noonan actually just spent several weeks in Ireland, but he kindly cut his trip short because he wanted to be with these men he has called Brother Knights for nearly 40 years. It is my pleasure to invite him to greet us tonight. Your Excellency. Thank you. Greetings to you, friends in Christ. I welcome our distinguished guests and cardinals, eminences, and our Supreme Chaplain, Archbishop Laurie, and my brother bishops, and priests, religious, sisters, brothers, and cordial welcome to Mr. Patrick Kelly, our Supreme Grand Knight, our Supreme Officers, Supreme Directors, and finally a warm welcome to all our brothers, knights, and their families. The Lord delights in the presence at this 101st Supreme Convention. Throughout the 141 years, the Knights of Columbus flourishes God's kingdom as an international organization. I welcome our brothers from Canada, the Philippines. I've met people from Mexico, Poland, Cuba, Ukraine, Lithuania, Korea, and so many other parts of the world. I offer you a very special welcome to our military service people from all the bases around the world. In the secular world, Central Florida may boast of hospitality and tourist attractions, but the real attraction is within the hearts of each person serving God. You may already have visited the Basilica of the National Shrine of Mary, Queen of the Universe, as one of the destinations on your agenda. The Catholic Church is living a Eucharistic revival, and the Catholic people of Central Florida join you, the Knights of Columbus, in the eternal invitation to know God and to live at the, as the heart of the Lord. We are grateful for the teaching resources of the Knights of Columbus. They have prepared on the Eucharist. You have offered the richness of God's fidelity, continuing his kindness for a thousand generations. 
The Knights of Columbus is a beacon, as the prophet Moses exclaims, in a world of stiff-necked people. You are the Eucharist for those whom you encounter, and you support of the people, the bishops, dis disenfranchised and those in God's perfection, with disabilities and in need, truly is a light to the world. You are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ as the care for God's people after natural disasters, fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. You present Jesus as you reach out to each person with dignity and compassion from the moment of conception to natural life. You remind us of our purpose, our mission, to live sacramentally. Every moment, every day that we create our world is holy. I'm most grateful to you for your continued support of our priestly and religious vocations. When I was rector of the seminary, I experienced the night's support firsthand. Now as a bishop, I also know of your continued prayers and financial support for our 18 seminarians here in Orlando. I would be remiss if I did not offer special rec recognition to the founders of the Knights of Columbus, the Venerable Father Michael McGivney. His example of charity, evangelization, and empowerment of the laity continues to bear fruit and guides the Knights of Columbus throughout the world today. He was a sower of the seed of the Word of God and truly planted the seed, assuring it fell on good soil. Today, there's so much discord within our world between one another. We cannot be a Eucharistic people if we do not seek unity through and with and in God. We are called not to love one another because of our politics or because of our sameness or any other reason. We are called to love one another as we are of God, made for God to live with God and made in his image and likeness. Pope Francis said, in practice, what does it mean to live love? Before giving us the commandment, Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples. Then he gave himself up to the wood on the cross. To love means this, to serve and to give one's life, to serve, to share the charisms and gifts that God has given us. Especially, we should ask ourselves, what do I do for others? May the patroness of the Knights of Columbus, Our Lady of Guadalupe, our mother of civilization of love, whose perfect love brought forth her son Jesus, gives us the bread of life through the Eucharist, leads us to serve as his dwelling place. Let us pray we too be transfigured and transfigure our world into his Eucharist. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We are so happy to be in Orlando, and thank you again for your gracious hospitality. And now, dinner will be served. Bon appetit. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the state songs to be performed, and this year we'll be doing them from Z to A. So let's welcome Wyoming. One, two, three, four. sunlight clear Wyoming Wyoming land that we hold so dear Wyoming Wyoming precious are thou and thine Wyoming Wyoming beloved state of mine Wisconsin
can see the state's dinner is totally underway and the music portion has begun uh, here at the 141st Supreme Convention in Isaac Columbus. And you know, Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly was just talking a couple of minutes ago, but earlier he gave his annual report during the opening session. We'd like to bring you some highlights from that report. Your Eminences, Your Beatitude, Your Excellency, my brother Knights. It's a privilege to welcome you to the Supreme Convention, and it's a pleasure to celebrate another great year. We had a year of faith in action and heroic charity. My brother Knights, thank you for everything you did and everyone you served. We stepped up in so many ways, all two million Knights of Columbus. We donated $185 million to charity and devoted 49 million hours to volunteer service. We protected Catholic families with a record $121 billion of life insurance in force. And around the world, we rose to meet the biggest challenges, from saving unborn children to supporting the people of Ukraine. I'm grateful to God for the way he has worked among us and through us. And as we look back at the past year, I am confident that Father McGivney is proud of us. Our actions reflect the best of our history, and they spring from the truth we hold in our hearts. As knights, what we do reflects who we are. We are faithful Catholics and disciples of Jesus Christ. We carry on a tradition that was planted in this land more than 450 years ago. The first Catholic settlement in the future United States was established right here in Florida in 1565. And the first person to step ashore was a Catholic chaplain, Father Francisco Lopez. Many have called him America's first parish priest. To this day, the city of St. Augustine is a testament to the Catholic Church's enduring influence on this continent. Three centuries later, another parish priest extended that influence. In 1882, while serving an immigrant parish in New Haven, Connecticut, Father Michael McGivney founded the Knights of Columbus. He gave us one mission to follow Christ, and he called us to fulfill it through faith and charity. For Father McGivney and the First Knights, faith and charity went hand in hand. They knew that spiritual poverty and material poverty both diminish human dignity and both demand a strong response. Our forefathers met this challenge by keeping families together. They helped men grow in virtue, and they helped parents raise their children in the faith. And they cared for families when disaster struck, especially when young fathers died. Father McGivney and the First Knights proved that faith and charity grow together. For as Christ himself commanded us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these words, we hear the call of the Knights of Columbus. Our fidelity to this mission has taken us from a small group of men in a parish basement to a global Catholic brotherhood. And today, our mission is more urgent than ever. Times have changed. The culture is growing more hostile to our faith. And the two institutions that are most essential to human flourishing, the family and the church, are facing mounting threats. In these difficult times, so much depends on our commitment to our mission. Will we be credible witnesses to a living faith? Will ours be a charity that evangelizes? Will we stand for the truth 
without apology, without counting the cost. Our answer is the same as Father McGivney's. Yes, we will point the world to Jesus Christ. He is the light that shines in the darkness, and he will shine through the Knights of Columbus. The challenges we face are many and serious. In this new era, forming Catholic men must be our top priority. I have said it before, and I will say it again. If we get the man right, we get everything right. The marriage, the family, the parish, the community. We need men who say yes to their God-given vocation. And we know what happens when men respond in faith. Consider St. Juan Diego. We are preparing for the 500th anniversary of Our Lady's apparition on Tepeyac Hill. In December 1531, she entrusted the message of her son's love to a humble layman. St. Juan Diego's yes set in motion the greatest conversion of the new world. And for more than 20 years, the order has been consecrated to Mary under her title, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And earlier this year, the board of directors made a pilgrimage to her shrine in Mexico City. There, kneeling before the tilma, I reconsecrated the order to Santa Maria de Guadalupe. And today, I ask the delegates here assembled to stand and join me in once again saying yes to Our Lady's message of God's love. Last year, I announced a new initiative focused on prayer, formation, and fraternity. It's called CORE, and I believe it's laying a foundation for our future. Here's a short video of CORE in action. We're at a time when more and more people are leaving the church. Young men are looking for the spiritual works of mercy and to gather for prayer and for fellowship and for the Knights to be able to provide that for them. In virtue of our baptism, we are all called to be missionary disciples. And that means to open up the doors of our Knights Council and to bring the good news of the gospel to the world. Our men have a natural hunger for God that's planted in their souls by our Creator. And so the fraternity, the formation, and the prayer of CORE provides an opportunity for these men to get in touch with what they're truly hungering for. Men are dying to grow in their faith, and I think there's no better organization than the Knights of Columbus to provide them with this experience. CORE exists to strengthen and form Catholic men in faith and virtue as missionary disciples and to draw them into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ through prayer, formation, and fraternity. The hope is that CORE animates everything that the Council does, from faith in action programs to the interaction with other ministries in the parish. I found that CORE has really brought together the men of my parish, the men of my council, in unique ways, ways that I didn't necessarily expect. Some of us in that room for the core sessions didn't know each other before, but we are developing relationships with others here in the parish. The most valuable part of core for me has been the brotherhood. The fraternity has helped me to find a group of men that I can practice the faith with, make lifelong connections. We're in a battle, aren't we? Uh, that first core really helped us to, to see the battle and to know that we're not alone, that we have each other as brothers that we have our Lord through prayer. The time that we do in prayer has been extremely powerful because coming from a non-Catholic background, I don't know a lot of the prayers. I've actually learned them. I've learned the rosary. 
CORE has been a great opportunity for me personally to grow with our guys on campus, grow in faith and prayer and fraternity with everyone who comes. Esto va a traer a hermanos en la fe y hermanos en los consejos a disfrutar su experiencia en el consejo porque empezamos con lo básico, la oración, nuestras creencias, nuestras prácticas católicas, la formación en la fe y sobre todo el aspecto de practicar la fraternidad. Through CORE, they have an experience of peer support so that they can encourage one another in being faithful to what God calls them to do. We do what we do as knights because it's the fruit of our relationship with Jesus Christ. I really do believe that God wants CORE to happen. And if you just make that leap of faith, the Holy Spirit will do the rest. We are formed through many things. This is the intentional growth in taking on the character, the mind, the heart of Christ. The heart of a knight lives for Christ, and the heart of a knight is a courageous one. And so we want to strengthen and empower knights to be courageous. This will transform the world. Core will be a game changer. The name is Latin for heart, and it reflects the reality that faith and fraternity are the heart of who we are. Core is designed for Catholic men. It provides much needed fellowship, drawing us closer together. As scripture says, and as every knight knows, a three ply cord is not easily broken. And Core will deepen our relationship with Christ making it easier to profess and defend what we believe. CORE is very practical, and it's proving effective. It's already helping men be better husbands and fathers. And it's also turning non-knights into new knights, because CORE is open to any Catholic man in the parish. Young Catholic men in particular are hungry for faith and fraternity. CORE gives them what they're looking for, and it opens their eyes to everything we offer. After a very successful pilot program in 21 jurisdictions, we're preparing to roll CORE out to the entire order. Every knight and every Catholic man of any age can find value in CORE. I encourage you to make it a priority and invite the men of your parish. We have many resources to help you launch CORE. To that end, we're introducing our first ever Bible study designed specifically for Catholic men. It's called Men of the Word, and when it comes to deepening our faith, nothing is more effective than the Word of God. This Bible study has the power to transform our lives. We're also preparing to debut a new video series on marriage, family, and fatherhood. It follows the model of Into the Breach, which has been viewed nearly one and a half million times. You'll find powerful testimonies and practical advice for living the faith as a family. I'm excited about this new series. Vanessa and I have three young daughters, Teresa, Caroline, and Meg. And nothing matters more to us than raising them with a love for the faith. The same is true for so many Catholic families, and it's an urgent need in the church. A recent poll found that only a third of Catholic parents care if their children keep the faith. Think about that. Only a third of parents care if their kids stay Catholic. This is one reason why so many young people have drifted away from the Catholic faith. But it doesn't have to be this way. A relationship with Christ is the greatest gift we can offer the next generation. The Knights of Columbus has a duty to help parents grow in their faith and pass it on to their children. Our new video series will help. 
Each of these new initiatives will further strengthen us in our Catholic faith, especially core. And they'll complement the already robust offerings of our Catholic Information Service, which is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. Since 1948, CIS has helped millions of Catholics deepen their understanding of the faith. We embrace this mission in many ways. On the day I was installed as Supreme Knight, I urged all of us to become Knights of the Eucharist. We are leading sponsors of the National Eucharistic Revival in the United States. As part of this effort, Councils across the country have held Eucharistic processions. And just two months ago, the Supreme Officers and State Deputies joined a special procession that began at St. Mary's, the birthplace of the Order. Our Supreme Chaplain, Archbishop William Laurie, led the way. Together, we brought Christ to the streets of New Haven, just as Father McGivney did before us. This is not the first procession to start at St. Mary's, nor will it be the last. Next May, one of the Revival's four cross-country processions will start at the tomb of Blessed Michael McGivney, America's parish priest. It will culminate in Indianapolis, where the National Eucharistic Congress will take place next July. I encourage every knight to embrace the Revival and deepen his faith in our Eucharistic Lord. Reaching new depths of faith will take us to new heights of charity. Father McGivney showed us the way. His love for Christ led him to care for widows and orphans. More recently, in our time, we had the extraordinary witness of St. Teresa of Calcutta. Like Father McGivney, her charity sprang from a love of Christ. I often think of one story that's told about her. Mother Teresa was caring for a leper in his final hours. As he was dying in her arms, she asked if she could tell him about Jesus. He was silent for a moment. Then he asked her, is this Jesus like you? She responded, no, but I am trying to be like him. The dying man replied, then I want to be a Christian. Mother Teresa shows us that faith leads to charity and charity leads to faith. Last year, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Mother Teresa's death, we produced a documentary celebrating her life. The film premiered at the Vatican, and I was honored to present a copy to Pope Francis. The Holy Father thanked us for bringing Mother Teresa's heroic witness to a new generation. Mother Teresa, no greater love, has played in more than 1,000 theaters from North and South America to Europe and beyond. It aired nationwide on PBS and EWTN, and next month it will air on ABC. The response has been tremendous. The film was the most popular faith documentary of 2022, and it was the second most popular documentary of any kind. 25 years after her death, Mother Teresa is inspiring the world all over again. Like St. Teresa of Calcutta, the Knights are committed to lives of service. And last year, in countless ways, we channeled our faith into charity. In the Middle East, we continue to aid persecuted Christians. Without our work, some of the most ancient Christian communities might have disappeared forever. But they're still here, and since 2014, we've provided more than $33 million to help them not only survive, but to build for the future.
Closer to home, we continue to stand with Catholics in indigenous communities. At the St. John Paul II National Shrine, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary of Kateri Tekakwitha's canonization. John Paul II beatified her and renewed the Church's commitment to indigenous communities. Pope Francis has continued this work in a personal way. Last summer, we helped the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops welcome the Holy Father to Canada in order to foster healing and reconciliation with indigenous people. This historic journey was broadcast throughout Canada by our friends at Salt and Light Media. Through our Native Solidarity Initiative, the Knights of Columbus will continue to walk in faith with our indigenous brothers and sisters. Our mission calls us to reach out to others in a spirit of love. And with the pandemic over, we redoubled our support for the least fortunate. This year marks the 20th anniversary of our wheelchair initiative. We started in 2003 by helping landmine victims in Afghanistan. And last year, we partnered with the Global Wheelchair Mission and we gave the gift of mobility to more than 10,000 people. All told, in the past two decades, we've given more than 127,000 wheelchairs to those in need. We also gave more than $5.3 million in the wake of natural disasters in the past year. That includes our response to Hurricane Ian, the deadliest storm to strike Florida in a century. We also responded to Hurricane Fiona, the most destructive in Canadian history. Wherever disaster strikes, our brother knights are on the ground helping families and communities recover. During the past year, we helped our priests and seminarians with more than $3.7 million in scholarships and support. It shows our enduring commitment to being the strong right arm of the Catholic Church. With that same strength, we teamed up with disabled athletes from around the world. In the last five years alone, Brother Knights have contributed over $21 million to Special Olympics. And at competitions from coast to coast, we were there with helping hands and encouraging words. Finally, there's Knights of Columbus Coats for Kids. We launched Coats for Kids in 2009 with a simple goal to give children the gift of warmth in the coldest months. And this winter, we will reach a historic milestone. We will distribute our one millionth coat to a child in need. When it comes to charity, we do much more than donate money and goods. The time we give is even more meaningful. In Virginia, Brother Knights didn't just buy wheelchairs for veterans, they delivered them in person. At one VA facility, they showed up with 20 wheelchairs for disabled heroes. In Puebla, Mexico, Knights bring blankets and food to the homeless of their city every month. And in Angers, France, Knights do something similar. Before the sun rises, they take to the streets to give food to the homeless. When Hurricane Ian hit Florida, men from St. Catherine Drexel Council 14212 packed their vans, drove across the state, and set up shop at a flooded gas station. In three hours, these nights gave away pallets of water, 300 meals, and 250 rosaries. And in the Philippines, nights took disaster response to a new level. They gave food and clothes to flood victims while planting new trees in devastated areas. Filipino Knights are rebuilding what Pope Francis has called our common home. There are so many other acts of service I could name. 
to every brother knight who volunteered last year, thank you. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. One charitable effort deserves special mention. I speak, of course, about our support for Ukraine. Last year, within 36 hours of Russia's invasion, we established the Ukraine Solidarity Fund. We called on councils to host fundraisers and rallied others to support this worthy cause. Eighteen months later, we have raised over $21 million. I cannot think of another time in history when so many gave so much so fast. Ukraine reminds us of the words of St. Paul, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Before I speak about our work in Ukraine, I'd like you to see it. said to Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly, the biggest gift of God to Ukraine today is a brotherhood of Knights of Columbus. Хочу виразити велику вдячність рицарям Колумба за цю велику солідарність. Це є харизма рицарі Колумба допомагати страждаючим, допомагати тим, які мають потребу. Father McGivney were here today, I think he'd be very proud about how we are carrying on his mission that he founded to care for the widow and the orphan, to care for the vulnerable. That's why we were founded. In a very real sense, our support for Ukraine started in Poland. While our Ukrainian brothers are on the front lines of war, our Polish brothers are right beside them on the front lines of charity. Since the beginning of the war, they have run mercy centers for Ukrainian refugees, mostly women and children. They offer food and water, as well as counseling and spiritual care. And through our KFC charity convoys, Polish Knights have delivered truckloads of supplies directly into Ukraine, into the middle of a war zone. 
I traveled to Poland in December, where I met with President Andrzej Duda. I presented him and his nation with our Caritas Award. It recognizes extraordinary works of charity for the sake of others. That's certainly true of the Polish people, and it's especially true of our Polish Knights. We are joined today by our State Deputy from Poland, Krzysztof Zuba, as well as well as our new Supreme Warden, Andrzej Anasiak, the first ever Supreme Officer from Europe. We are also grateful to welcome the Ukraine delegation led by State Deputy Yuri Maletsky. Would all our knights from Ukraine and Poland please stand up? You are a sterling example of first in faith and charity. After my trip to Poland, I traveled into Ukraine itself. I wish every night could see what I saw. It was Advent. Normally there would have been Christmas lights everywhere, but not last year. Russian missiles had taken out much of Ukraine's power grid. The electricity that was left was needed for hospitals and humanitarian relief. Everywhere I went, I met with families who had lost their belongings, their homes, and yes, their loved ones. But I saw something else, something profound. Despite all they've been through, the Ukrainian people still have hope, a hope that springs from faith. Amid the darkness of war, the Catholic Church continues to be a ray of light. I traveled with the leaders of both the Roman Catholic Church and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. We visited parishes, convents, and seminaries that have opened their doors to refugees. And to this day, I am struck by the words of Major Archbishop Sviatislav Shevchuk. Reflecting on Russian atrocities, his beatitude spoke of the duty to cultivate love. For, as he said, and I quote, hatred gives birth to criminals, but love gives birth to heroes. My friends, Ukraine is becoming a nation of heroes. And we are joined by two of them today. Archbishop Mishisław Mokszynski of Lviv and Bishop Mihailo Bubni of Odessa. <laughs> Your Excellencies, thank you for being courageous shepherds. While in Ukraine, I spoke with many refugees. Their courage was striking, and I will always remember meeting a mother and her two daughters, one of whom was paralyzed. They cried as they described the violence they left behind, and they thanked the Knights for helping them find a path forward. Without that refugee center, they would have been on the streets they might not have survived the brutal winter, but they did survive because they had a roof over their heads, food in their stomachs, and faith in their hearts. On behalf of the entire order, I made a promise to that family and to every refugee I met. You are not alone. We are with you, and the Knights of Columbus are not going anywhere.
Our support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people takes many forms. That includes a partnership with the Pontus Foundation to protect Ukrainian women and girls from human trafficking. This crisis is real and it's global. Worldwide, more than 27 million people are victims of human trafficking. When I became Supreme Knight, we launched an effort to confront this evil. And I am grateful for the remarkable success of the recent movie, Sound of Freedom, which has drawn greater attention to it. The Knights of Columbus is fighting human trafficking for a simple reason. As Catholic men, we protect vulnerable women and children. Every human being is made in the image of God, and no human being should ever be bought or sold. <laughs> Beyond Ukraine, we're tackling this crisis in the Philippines. In partnership with the Arise Foundation, Filipino Knights are working with religious sisters to help young women and girls recognize this danger. They're also building a national network to support victims. And I would especially like to thank our Supreme Director Emeritus from the Philippines, Justice Jose Reyes, for his strong leadership. Human trafficking is a pervasive evil that lurks just beneath the surface, and I am proud of our efforts to combat it. Here's a video about the work of our Filipino Knights. Whenever I give talks in the schools, the children are out there. I ask them, please follow after me. I am made in the image and likeness of God. I am not for sale. I am not for sale. Nang ako ay 14 years old, bilinta po ako ng mama ko. Ako ako, nag-start na po ako magtrabaho like nang... Pakikipag-check sa lalaki kapalit ng pera dahil sa pamilya namin. May mga ginawang alipin sa ibang bansa. Minsan patay na ho silang niyuwi. Kaya natatakot ho ako para sa akin, sa aking asawa, sa aking pamilya, na baka ho minsan isang araw mangyari ho, rin ho sa amin. Human trafficking, it's not a problem isolated to one country. The market is unfortunately driven mainly by men in the US, in the UK, in Western Europe. And what they're looking for, sadly, is slavery and sexual exploitation of children. Parents in the Philippines, uh, being desperate for money, have, in many cases, exploited their own children. This place is a shelter to the victims of human trafficking. What we do is not only transform them from the state of vulnerability to state of empowerment. We try to go after the traffickers. What Arise is doing is really in line with the objectives of the Knights of Columbus to help the disabled, the sick, the oppressed, and especially women and children. I hope this partnership will endure and last for long. I see every human person as a child of God, created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore should be respected, should be upheld, and should be, should be honored. The Knights are absolutely critical to the work of Arise. They have supported us, hugely financially, but that's not all. Understanding that what we're doing here is about accompaniment of people, is about long-term loving care. 
I would like to express my deep gratitude to the Knights of Columbus for their continued support to Arise. You are helping a lot of people. God loves you. Our principle of charity compels us to serve the most vulnerable. And our principle of patriotism leads us to serve our countries. Since our founding, Brother Knights have fought to defend freedom wherever we live. We've stood strong to uphold foundational principles like human dignity and religious freedom. And we've advanced equal justice regardless of race, religion, or nationality. Our love of country compels us to be faithful citizenship citizens of whatever country we call home, and our work is far from done. In the United States, the anti-Catholic bigotry of the 19th and early 20th century is re-emerging in new ways. Some 60 years after the election of John F. Kennedy, our first Catholic president and a brother knight, we are once again being intimidated and excluded. Our religious liberty is under threat, and our deepest beliefs are being labeled as hate speech. Let me be clear, there is nothing hateful about the sanctity of marriage, the reality of biological sex, or the humanity of the unborn child, and the Knights of Columbus will never apologize for defending the truth. for the truth. We stand for the truth because it's right, even when it leads to ridicule and scorn. Like all of you, I was shocked to see a professional baseball team honor an anti-Catholic hate group that masquerades as nuns. This group mocks our Lord and Our Lady in the foulest ways, and they insult the courageous women religious who have dedicated their lives to prayer and service. I can think of no more blatant example of the new anti-Catholic bigotry. We are joined today by members of the Missionaries of Charity, the Sisters of Life, the Nashville Dominicans, and the Sisters of the Company of the Savior. And we are also very honored to welcome the Secretary General of Vatican City, Sister Raffaella Petrini of the Franciscan Sisters of the Eucharist. I ask, I ask every sister who is with us today to please stand. Thank you for standing taller than those who mock you. Sisters, know that we love you. We've long defended our fundamental right to practice our beliefs and participate in society. That was true a century ago when we fought the Ku Klux Klan and the Know Nothings. As part of that effort, we endowed a chair of American history at the Catholic University of America. And a hundred years later, we've endowed a new chair at CUA's Columbus School of Law. Kevin Walsh is now the Knights of Columbus Professor of Law and the Catholic Tradition. I'm proud to call him a brother knight, and this distinguished scholar is already making important contributions to the defense of our religious liberty. And I'm grateful that Professor Walsh is with us today.
Such efforts spring from our commitment to patriotism. And that same spirit moves us to support the men and women of the armed forces. Whether it's our military prayer book or warriors to lords, we stand with those in uniform. As a veteran myself, I know firsthand the stress and difficulties of military life. I also know the life-saving difference that a Catholic chaplain can make. That's why I'm proud of our continued partnership with the Archdiocese for the Military Services. With our support, the co-sponsored seminarian program has helped train 63 military chaplains. For more than 17 years, our outreach to the military has been the passion of one man in particular. He served three decades in the Marine Corps, including four tours in Vietnam. And since 2006, he served as our advisor for military and veterans affairs. Colonel Chuck Galena is preparing to retire later this year. Colonel, we thank you and we salute you. We stand with our troops because they keep our families safe. Yet, as Catholic men, we all have a duty to protect families. Father McGivney built the Knights around that foundational truth, and he charged us with caring for widows and orphans through our life insurance program. When the first Knights pooled their money for mutual aid, they put their faith into action. And so do we. And we've taken our founding vision into bold new territory. We've been in the Fortune 1000 for 14 years in a row. We continue to earn superior ratings from AM Best and Standard & Poor's. And for the second year running, Forbes has recognized us as one of America's best life insurance companies. For us, being first in faith and charity also means being first in Catholic finance. We answer God's call to protect families and care for mothers and children, and we help families secure their financial future. Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors empowers Catholics to invest in line with our faith. We started offering our investment services to Catholic institutions in 2015. And two years ago, we made our mutual funds available to members and non-members alike. Today, we manage more than $2.3 billion for Catholic families, religious communities, and dioceses. It's clear that Catholics want to carry their faith into their finances. And the same is true of their charitable giving. Generous individuals and families have now entrusted more than $100 million to the Knights of Columbus Charitable Fund. KCCF donor-advised funds help you support the charitable causes that matter to you while fully upholding the Catholic faith. Last year alone, donors to the Charitable Fund distributed nearly $21 million to worthy charities. There is much more I could say about the faith foundation of our business, but this year I want to do something different. I want to describe the faithful men who personify our business. Behind every purchase of a life insurance policy in every sale of an investment product is a brother knight. We have nearly a thousand agents who strive every day to be first in faith and charity. This isn't just their job, it's their calling. 
A recent story reminded me of this. One of our agents came to the job late in his career. He was tired of business as usual, and he wanted to put his faith into action. It wasn't long before he got the worst kind of call. A brother knight had died, and his grieving widow was desperate for help. He dropped what he was doing, and he went to her house. She needed help with her husband's KFC insurance policy. Then she told him that her husband had four policies with other companies, and she didn't know what to do or where to start. Our agent spent the rest of the day calling those companies and completing the paperwork. He lifted a burden from her shoulders and carried it himself. This agent is with us today. Bob Gordon, thank you for embodying the best of the Knights of Columbus. Bob, you and all your agents make us proud. Our insurance program is thriving because it's built on faith. The same is true of our membership, and last year's growth was strong. We now have more than 2,084,000 knights around the world in 16,672 councils. And I'm pleased to report that we've hit a major milestone. More than 100,000 men have joined the Knights through online membership. We are reaching a new generation, and we are setting the stage for a new era of impact. Why do we continue to grow? Why, at a time when the Catholic Church faces serious demographic challenges, is the order expanding year after year? I believe the reason is simple. In this age of mediocrity, the Knights of Columbus invites men to greatness, to sacrifice themselves for the good of others, and to commit to a higher call with a band of brothers and to stand strong in the breach, side by side, instead of being swept away by the culture one at a time. We're seeing with CORE that faith is drawing more men to the Knights, and we will continue to grow our membership so long as we grow together as husbands, fathers, and Catholic men. Every knight is committed to this mission, and our college knights deserve special mention. I joined the knights at Marquette University when I was 19. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. Back then, it wasn't as hard to be a Catholic on campus, but it's far more difficult today. And that's why our nearly 300 college councils are so important. At this very hour, a delegation of college knights is in Lisbon attending the opening mass of World Youth Day. College knights are making a deliberate decision to embrace the faith together. And their witness on campus is especially needed in this day and age. The U.S. Surgeon General recently reported that we are living through an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. I submit that the Knights of Columbus offers a cure. In this time of loneliness, we offer fraternity. In this era of isolation, we extend the hand of friendship. And in a world that offers apathy and anger, we invite men to lives of meaning and mission. Every day, our brother knights do just that. 
and our defense of life is especially inspiring. It's been 13 months since Roe v. Wade was overturned. From the moment the Dobbs decision came down, we've stepped up with even greater leadership and resolve. In the last year, Knights delivered countless boxes of supplies to pregnancy centers and maternity homes. And we've now donated 1,745 ultrasound machines. Each one helps mothers choose life. At our convention last year, I announced a major new pro-life initiative called ASAP, Aid and Support After Pregnancy. We set a bold target of $5 million going entirely to pregnancy centers and maternity homes. We didn't meet that goal. We exceeded it by more than $1 million. Last January, we gathered for the 50th annual March for Life. But it was the first March for Life in post-Roe America. Knights from across the country traveled to Washington, D.C. for this historic moment. That morning, we co-hosted the first ever Life Fest with the Sisters of Life. This new rally for high school and college students drew more than 4,000 young people. Let's take a look. Today, right now, we're witnessing Life Fest, an incredible event being put on by the Sisters of Life and the Knights of Columbus to gather young people here to help promote the sanctity of life. March for Life and making the March for Life the longest human rights demonstration. We knew we were coming and we knew other people had hearts to come and we wanted to be able to provide a venue and a space and a message so that we can enter into this new era with a language that love is the answer and uh, we wanted to be able to let the young people be with each other and celebrate the gift of life. Building a culture of life it's not a once a year thing, it's not a one time thing. Building a culture of life is a way that we live every day. Life Fest is a very outward sign of that culture of life. This is a, a huge success, this event, being here to stand for life, that really is an important and monumental thing to do. We need to bring people together so we can strengthen one another in what is one of the most important causes of this time, which is the beauty, the goodness, the dignity of the human person. So praise God, the Knights of Columbus and the Sisters of Life were able to come together and bring this dream into reality. I think so often we sell our young people short. They are looking for love. They are looking for a way out of isolation. They want to experience communion and union with one another. And I have great hope for this generation. We are grateful for our long-running partnership with the Sisters of Life. And few have done more for unborn children and their mothers than their founding Superior General. Tonight, we will joyfully present the Order's highest honor, the Gaudium et Spes Award, to our very dear friend, Mother Agnes Mary Donovan. Together with the Sisters of Life, thousands of Knights joined the National March for Life. 
Thousands more join state marches throughout the year. And from France to the Philippines, from Canada to South Korea, we stood for life around the world. Our goal is the same with every march. Win more hearts, change more minds, and enshrine the right to life in the laws of the land. And I'd like to acknowledge the outstanding leadership of the March for Life president who was with us today. Jeannie Mancini, we stand with you and we will march with you until abortion is unthinkable. Now that Roe has been overturned, some fear that the pro-life movement is losing steam. But the opposite is true. As I marched with my brother Knights in January, I felt a renewed sense of hope. It came in large part from the people who filled the streets in every direction. Our movement is young and passionate and filled with energy and we have justice on our side. My hope hasn't dimmed since then. In fact, it's grown even stronger. Since the end of Roe, nearly half of our states have taken new steps to protect life. And as I stand before you today, 14 states have ended abortion altogether, and more are on the way. We've supported this progress at every step, and we have fought efforts that would endanger more babies and their mothers. Despite our victories, we've suffered some hard losses, but we need to remember the fight for life is far from over. Life will be on the ballot in many states over the next two years. This November, Ohio, will vote on whether to put the so-called right to abortion into its constitution. Radical activists are already pouring millions of dollars into this battle. They think it will be the beginning of the end of the pro-life movement, but we will prove them wrong. Think back to where we were just a few years ago. The powers that be said Roe was settled law. They said it would never be overturned, but the pro-life movement kept the faith, and we carried the day. And the Knights of Columbus will continue to fight until the, light, until the right to life is fully restored. For 141 years, by God's grace, we have risen to meet the biggest challenges. Our hearts are filled with gratitude, and we make our own the ancient prayer of the Church. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory. And with God's help, we will continue to lead the way in faith and charity. Father McGivney did exactly that. He empowered Catholic men to achieve great things, growing together in love of God and love of neighbor. And it all began in the basement of a church in Connecticut. That church has always been our spiritual home. It's the resting place of our founder, and its ties to the order are only growing stronger. Just last month, the Archbishop of Hartford merged St. Mary's with New Haven's seven other churches to form a citywide parish. It's the first in the world named after our founder. Archbishop Blair, on behalf of all your brother knights, thank you for making St. Mary's Church part of the new Blessed Michael McGivney Parish.
Father McGivney was ahead of his time, and the last three popes have all recognized it. St. John Paul II said that his vision, quote, remains as relevant as ever in the changed circumstances of today's church and society. Pope Benedict XVI spoke of, quote, the remarkable accomplishment of that exemplary American priest. And he confirmed Father McGivney's heroic virtue, putting him on the path to beatification. I reflected on this in January at Pope Benedict's funeral. I was there with the Supreme Officers to bid farewell to this extraordinary servant of Christ and his church. And we were far from the only ones. For three days from early morning until late at night, hundreds of thousands of people waited for hours to enter St. Peter's Basilica. They came to pay their respects to a Pope who only ever aspired to be a humble worker in the vineyard of the Lord. And today, here, the Knights of Columbus thanks and honors that great and holy man, Pope Benedict XVI. Benedict advanced our Founder's cause, declaring him venerable, and Pope Francis named him blessed, describing Father McGivney, and I quote, as an outstanding witness of Christian solidarity and fraternal assistance. We will always be grateful to Pope Francis for bringing our Founder one step closer to canonization. Archbishop Laurie and I personally thanked the Holy Father in a meeting earlier this year. The Pope once again expressed his esteem for Father McGivney, and he told us just how much he appreciates the Knights of Columbus. We spoke at length about our work, including our new core initiative. We also discussed our charity, especially our support for Ukrainian refugees. Pope Francis was grateful for everything we're doing, and he called on the Knights of Columbus to continue advancing the Church's mission. This is a challenge we gladly accept. We will continue to take up the mission of evangelization in our hearts and in our communities, and we will continue our mission of charity, a charity that evangelizes. When Father McGivney created the order, he called us to this life of service. Catholic men rallied to the cause in his time. And in our time, we will inspire a new generation of men on a mission, first in faith and charity. Vivat Jesus. As she took these words of the fourth vow of her community, they took hold of her, defining her character as well as the path and purpose of her life over these last three decades. But let us go back to the earlier life of our recipient. Let us discover the path of dedication and discernment that God guided her along with such loving care so that we may see in her a true disciple of the Lord working in a decidedly difficult apostolate. Raised in a devout Catholic family with parents who made the reality of God apparent in their daily lives, our honoree attended Catholic schools where she witnessed true feminine genius in the strength and learning of the teaching sisters. 
and was schooled in the depths of prayer through the instruction of a Jesuit priest. She was a young woman coming of age when the infamous Roe versus Wade decision was handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973. And she was devastated to realize that unborn children enjoyed no protection in our nation. She turned to fervent prayer and began regularly reciting the, the rosary outside of abortion facilities. Continuing her studies, she earned a doctoral degree in psychology from the University of North Carolina. She then served on the faculties of the College of William and Mary and Columbia University, where she was the director of research for Columbia's Literacy Center. While working in academia as a licensed clinical and educational psychologist, she sensed that God had more in store for her. Cardinal O'Connor's column, with its unique appeal, was the catalyst for what she has called the best decision of her life. With guidance from the Cardinal, she was one of the eight initial members of the Sisters of Life. Her deep life of prayer, coupled with an, with an academic and clinical knowledge of the human person, then led her to become the first superior of the Sisters of Life in 1993, responsible for anchoring the community in its charism and guiding it to holiness. Since that day, she has been known to all as mother, and there is no better way to describe her. Her maternal care extends to the sisters of the still-growing religious community, to bishops and priests who have served them, and in a special way to the women and their babies, born and unborn, who have come to live with the Sisters of Life or sought in any way the help and healing offered by her beautiful community. Now three decades in the making, the Sisters of Life have grown from a small band of sisters in one convent to nearly 130 religious sisters. And every day, every day, they bring God's love to women and to children. They do so at two convents, an apostolic center, a mother house in New York, a retreat center in Stamford, Connecticut, and apostolates in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Denver, Phoenix, and Toronto. In addition to welcoming pregnant women into their homes and caring for them and their babies after birth, the sisters field countless, often urgent calls on a crisis pregnancy hotline. They host post-abortion healing retreats for those seeking to recover and reclaim their lives while providing guidance to single women on vocation retreats and to college students, young adults, and women and men of all ages through their mission of evangelization. The Sisters of Life support the pro-life movement in all these ways and more with prayer and loving care. Through all the community's manifold works and hours, days, weeks, months, and years of prayer and contemplation before the Blessed Sacrament, Mother is led by example and guided them with wisdom. 
She offers everything to God for the good of others, and she has been one of the most significant leaders in the Catholic Church, bar none, and the broader society for more than 30 years. She has been a highly esteemed collaborator of three Supreme Knights, and the entire Order of the Knights of Columbus has been blessed by her wise counsel and sustained by her prayers. Therefore, it is with great joy and hope for the future of the Sisters of Life and the pro-life movement that the Knights of Columbus recognizes this extraordinary herald of the gospel of life by bestowing its Gaudium et Spes award upon the founding superior general of the Sisters of Life, Mother Agnes Mary Donovan. The Sisters of Life is a community of religious women in the Catholic Church founded by Cardinal O'Connor on June 1st of 1991. It became obvious to him that the culture of death was truly a demonic reality and that what now was needed was a spiritual response and the Sisters of Life would be that spiritual response to the culture of death. Mother Agnes was working as a professor of psychology at Columbia University. She heard Cardinal O'Connor describe the Sisters of Life and this community he wished to build. And she knew that this was the place where God was calling her to pour out her life and her love. Cardinal O'Connor would often say, some bishops build cathedrals, but we are his cathedral. So he laid the foundation and Mother Agnes built upon that. Mother Agnes and the Sisters of Life have led a subtle, but I think important shift in the pro-life movement. Marches, litigation, strategy, those are all important things. But she's taught us that the ultimate answer is love. Love for the vulnerable mother and her baby is what will truly build a culture of life. Mother Agnes has really been an architect of the culture of life. She's taught us that it's not a crisis to be solved or a problem to be fixed, but it's about a love to be given. What I would say when the history is written, Mother Agnes would be an early example of the positive force of the pro-life movement. She was the first one I ever heard to articulate what is now taken for granted, that we are pro-women and we are pro-baby, and we must take care of both of them. St. Joan of Arc once said, act and God will act, work and he will work. Mother Agnes and the Sisters of Life are such a great testimony to those words. Every day you see God working in their lives and in the lives of the women and children they've done so much to help. I know that the sisters will walk with women, help them find doctors, help them find employment. Mother Agnes, in her loving care of everyone as an individual, reminds us that the culture of life is each person. I got pregnant with my first child and I did not want to go through the pregnancy, so I decided that I was going to get an abortion my local church they referred me to the sisters of life and that's how the journey began they just provide everything possible that you need so i want to thank mother agnes for her leadership her encouragement throughout these 20 years she never stopped encouraging me none of my children would be here without the sisters and mother agnes there's a glow around mother agnes wherever she went she's so wise and she's so kind and loving I wasn't expecting to be evangelized as an adoptive couple, but we were. Last month, 
we were having a graduation party for our daughters, Marie and Christina, where I, I just realized none of this would have happened today had it not been for these two birth moms finding the Sisters of Life. And had their hearts not been open and had the sisters not been there to welcome them, our lives would look very different. They've created an ever-growing community of saved families. So who knows how many babies have been saved and how many mothers and fathers have been brought back to the knowledge that Jesus loves them. I think Mother Agnes's legacy will be far-reaching and lasting. She has helped to raise up a new generation of pro-life leadership in the United States. Even though she is retiring as the superior of the Sisters of Life, her voice will continue to resonate in the pro-life movement. Mother Agnes, as I see it, was really the chosen instrument of God. Her love and her life poured out so completely to God, to her sisters, to our charism. And we will be echoing her yes, which will resound through generations of sisters and throughout the whole church. Gaudium et spes, joy and hope. Mother Agnes is a great witness of joy and hope. Those qualities were instilled in them by Cardinal O'Connor, and for more than 30 years, they've been nurtured in profoundly beautiful ways by the quintessential sister of life, Mother Agnes. And now, on behalf of the entire Order of the Knights of Columbus, it is my singular privilege to bestow our highest honor, the Gaudium et Spes Award, upon a true beacon of joy and hope, Mother Agnes Mary Donovan, Founding Superior General of the Sisters of Life. Thank you, thank you. Oh my goodness. It is such an honor. And as deeply honored as I am, I am more deeply humbled by this award. So I wish to thank you, Patrick Supreme Knight, Patrick Kelly, Supreme Chaplain, uh, where there you are, Archbishop Laurie, and the entire board of directors of the Knights of Columbus for simply the joy of this evening, this award, and most of all, for your service to the church and her people. You bring God's mercy and hope to so many. It is hard for me to receive this award knowing that our founder received it, but I think he would be deeply pleased at the same time 
and smile broadly at what the award brings to support the Sisters of Life's future efforts. To be honored by the Knights of Columbus, I tell you, has a very special meaning because the Sisters of Life have great esteem for their leadership and admiration for an order in the church who early on, with intelligence and conviction, took up the defense of every human life and gave pride of place to this human rights issue in its charitable works. This evening, I thought I would want to share with you a look into the heart of the Sisters of Life, that you might see the love that fuels our works. Our services begin with an invitation to community, the human need to belong, to have a place in a community, in a family, is literally written into our spiritual DNA. The Knights of Columbus know the power of the experiences of authentic Catholic community, of belonging to the family of faith as a most effective context for evangelization. Let me share with you an encounter I had some years ago which illustrates this point. As I was boarding a plane heading home for New York, a young woman, and I'll call her Karen, took the seat next to mine. She was in her late 20s, beautiful and full of life. And I was hoping for a couple of hours of prayer, frankly, and I squirmed to dislodge my prayer books from under the seat and smiled apologetically at her. And she leapt at the opportunity, saying, it's funny that you are here. I've always wanted to know about the Trinity. I stared at her, stunned. Whoever asks about the Trinity? And then, using the analogy of spousal love, of the total fruitful giving and receiving of love between spouses, I shared with her that the best human comparison of the love and life of God, one God in three persons, as the Catechism tells us, by sending his only Son, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us to share in that ex exchange. Karen looked at me in amazement, saying, I knew God was going to do something great with this trip. I've just about decided to leave my marriage. And thus began a conversation that spanned half the country. And as we explored a way of loving that would allow her to remain committed to her marriage, even in the present difficulties. Oh, yes. The attack on the communion of love and marriage and family life was the first and is the oldest of the evil one's strategies. It's as old as Genesis, as old as Adam and Eve, a strategy used by the enemy to destroy man's faith in the gift of human love and ultimately in a God who is love. Because marriage is the closest human image we have to the love and the life of God. As Christians, human relationships possess a sacred character. For we encounter in the other an icon of the living God. C.S. Lewis captures this reality when he states next to the Blessed Sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And if he is your Christian neighbor. He is holy in almost the same way, for in him also Christ. Glory itself is hidden. To live in communion with others requires God's grace. My new friend Karen learned that speaking of the Holy Trinity at 30,000 feet in the air, and it became a reality in her heart when she joined us to pray before Jesus exposed in the Blessed Sacrament in our convent chapel. Jesus' parting words to his followers were ones you know so well, love one another. 
as I have loved you. The question is, how do we love as God loves? What does such love look like? Within the, within the Sisters of Life, we call it the secret of loving. This way of love has three parts, receptivity, discovery, and delighting. First, receptivity. Love demands an openness of mind and heart to receive the other. It's an attitude which expresses to the other that I have nothing more important to do than to be with you at this moment. Secondly, discovery. As I sit beside, as I sit before the person, the first act of love is interior. It is allowing myself to be moved by the beauty, the strength, the vulnerability, or the sheer goodness of the other. Love, in a certain sense, calls out to my heart, for it is the other who is attracting me, as if it were, from within my heart. Even in the one who is difficult to love, our challenge is to allow ourselves to discover that something within the person that can move our hearts. I promise you it's possible to find that something if we allow our hearts to search for the good, for that which is delightful within the other. Because we know that over each person, God has said, you are very good and I love you. Each person bears the imprint of his love and life in their being. Delighting in the other, the third part. Why put in the effort to discover that which moves us in the other? Because when we find it, we then can mirror, reflecting back to the person, that which we have found within them that delights us. Then not only are we changed by her goodness, but so is she. The person before us experiences herself as affirmed precisely in the realization that it is a goodness within her which has caused my delight. And this affirmation is the source of new psychic birth, the emotional food needed for growth as a human person. And this is not white knuckle love. Indeed, ideally charitable acts done for another should be preceded by first being moved by the other in love, otherwise, the other person is likely to get the impression that we love them only because we are good or because we must. We're a parent or a spouse, but not because of any goodness within them that moves us. Far from sentimentality, this love is the image of the love of God. It is the way of God's love. Often, such love requires courage to look beyond the distressing disguises of the sinful, the weak, or the vulnerable one before me, and to love them with consistency, perseverance, fortitude, and delight. To love in this way is to grow in virtue. And in the end, we can truly say it is I who have received the greater part in having loved and served you. What a privilege it is to encounter in another person the unique goodness and gifts of God. And with it, lives are awakened, relationships changed. Let me tell you of Carol, a woman we served, who returned to visit the sisters several years after having lived with us. And upon her return, she was so eager to share with us her many new accomplishments. She ran through all the good news. She'd graduated with a professional degree in nursing. She was confident of a good first job. She had decorated her, her apartment for the first time, beautifully and simply, an expression of her own new sense of self-worth. And then she looked back at us, and she completed the picture by saying, you know, it's funny. I'm just beginning to experience myself as the person you always knew me to be. Yes, true love is possible in our families, in our charitable works, 
in our parishes and in your Knight of, Knights of Columbus councils. The world is searching for it, and it is Jesus whom they seek. Let us receive the gift of God's love that we may be emissaries of Jesus who made such love possible. I thank you. May God bless you. We love you. Mother Agnes, thank you for those beautiful words. Your witness to love is a great inspiration to us. Vanessa and I are truly grateful for your friendship, and the Knights of Columbus is grateful for your faithful leadership of the pro-life cause. I truly believe that the partnership between the Knights of Columbus and the Sisters of Life is a great sign of God's providence. And tonight, I promise that our collaboration will only grow stronger in the years ahead. The pro-life movement is at a crossroads. After 50 years of marches, prayers, and efforts, Roe v. Wade has been relegated to the ash heap of history. God has brought us here for a reason. For, for three decades, we have been fortunate to have a, a partner such as Mother Agnes and we look forward to working very closely with Mother Mary Concepta. The Knights of Columbus and the Sisters of Life will stand together as we always have and always will. And we go forth with confidence in God, the Lord of life. Please join me in once again honoring Mother Agnes as well as Mother Mary Concepta and all the Sisters of Life. Now it's my pleasure to introduce another new leader in the church. Previously, we had the pleasure of working with him when he was General Secretary of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. And in March, we celebrated his appointment as Archbishop of Toronto, one of Canada's most vibrant Catholic communities. Please join me in welcoming His Grace, Archbishop Francis Leo. Praise be Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, as this blessed and memorable evening draws to a close, it is fitting to give thanks and praise to the Lord. We open our hearts in gratitude for the abundant gifts he has bestowed upon us. Salvation in the Lord Jesus our Catholic faith, Holy Mother Church, Our Lady as Mother, Guide, and Intercessor, our vocations, and the many opportunities to build together the kingdom of God, the promise of everlasting life. We highlight the gift of Blessed Michael McKivney, 
and through him that of the knights, the order always intent to proclaim Jesus, to spread the truth of the gospel, to serve with the heart of Christ and build a culture of life, first in faith and charity. And especially this evening, we are grateful and lift up in prayer to the Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift, the sisters of life, and in particular, the powerful, loving, and generous leadership of Mother Agnes Mary Donovan. From the humble beginnings of that divine intuition decades ago, the fruits have been abundant and continue to grow. The Archdiocese of Toronto is but one of the many blessed fields where the life-giving seeds of goodness, compassion, welcoming, and Christian charity are sown thanks to the outstanding witnessing of such remarkable women consecrated forever to Jesus. And so we turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name and thank you for your spirit that has been with us this evening and continues to inspire us along the path of holiness. You send Jesus among us as Redeemer, Brother, and Lord, who taught us by his words and examples the ways of the kingdom. May all that we say and do always be pleasing to you and benefit the lives of our brothers and sisters, especially those wounded and in need in so many ways. We entrust to your fatherly care all that we are and all that we have, so that you are glorified in all places and at all times and by all people, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And through the maternal mediation of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the intercession of Blessed Michael McGivney, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now, let us sing to the Blessed Mother. Please stand. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Rita Duceo, Eres Nostra Salve, Vivat Jesus. Thank you, Your Grace. And to all of you, thank you for joining us. Good night.
delegates are reminded that the tradi traditional Tuesday night caucus will convene now in the Canary Room on the right side as you pass by the corridor of the KFC countries. In addition and there you have it. That concludes today's coverage of the Knights of Columbus Convention, the 141st. Reminding you to join us tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time for the votive mass of Blessed Michael McGivney. For my co-host Jonathan Reyes, our entire EWTN team here in Orlando, have a good evening.